This lecture video is on the sense of touch, but in order to understand the sense of touch, we have to kind of step back and put it in perspective of our other five senses, each of which goes through a process that is known as transduction. Transduction is to take energy from the external world and put it into electrical signals that our brain can understand. So if you think about our five senses, each of these is doing that very process. Sight, for instance, is taking photic particles, light particles, and capturing them at the back of the eye and changing that into an electrical signal for the neurons to send it to the back of the brain and process as color and light. Hearing, similar process. We've got little hairs inside of our ears that are vibrating to and fro in response to mechanical airwaves of moving the hairs, and we're able to process that as hearing language. Smell and taste are based on chemical transduction, so you can see that different chemicals will land within our nose or on our tongue, and those change into electrical signals that are passed to our brain, and we experience them as smell and taste. Well, touch is just the same. It's a form of transduction that takes mechanical energy and transmits it into electrical energy that can be understood by neurons in our brain. Now, in order to understand how this occurs, I want to take a little image here and zoom in on the tiny little swatch of skin represented here by this square, and zoomed in a couple hundred thousand times. You can see here that these are something like what the nerve cells within the skin might look like. And these different nerve cells are in charge of different kinds of sensations. These are all related to touch, but they're different facets of touch. So you can see vibration and stretch and pain and touch are all mediated by different kinds of cells. And each of these is represented as a different color in this picture because each of them will travel up the length of the arm to the brain along its own particular trajectory, its line. And the brain will integrate all the information that's coming from the different sources of different kinds of cells, and it will put them into a whole experience. So individual cells might pick up on different facets of an object or an experience, and it might send that information to the brain, but just that one cell alone wouldn't be able to communicate anything meaningful about the experience of what we're touching. But all together, taken with all four or all five different kinds of cells that exist here, you could see that the, the, um, the brain can integrate all of them together into a, a whole piece of information, a whole experience. Well, I just want to talk for a second about each of these different kinds of cells in slightly more detail. You can see that each of them is responsible for a different thing. Pacinian corpuscles are sensitive to different textures, like running your hand along the length of sandpaper, for instance. Hair follicle receptors are sensitive to touch. As you read in your uh, abbreviated reading, you can see that the hair follicle is attached to an axon that is uh, that, that, that can sense its movements, and it changes those mechanical movements of hair into an electrical signal that's sent up to the brain down the length of that axon. Merkel's discs represented here, respond to isolated points of an object. So if it's round or flat, if it's sharp or smooth, Meissner's corpuscles respond to changes in an object, like if it flutters or vibrates. And Ruffini endings detect stretching of the skin, like when we move our fingers or limbs, our skin is literally shifting, it's stretching, and the Ruffini endings are able to pick up on that and send signals to the brain. Finally, our free nerve endings respond to pain and heat and cold. Now I want to take a second and delve into this Piscinian corpuscle as one example of these different kinds of receptors that are here, because this will help us understand how the skin is able to transduce mechanical energy into electrical energy that the brain can understand. So the Piscinian corpuscle is represented here as a flat disc with an axon that goes up to the brain. If we zoom in on this tiny little swatch here, you can see that a nerve membrane at rest looks something like this. Outside the cell, you've got some fluids filled with chemicals. This is sodium chemicals floating in the fluid. On the surface of this cell, you've got a series of a bunch of different channels. This right here represents the edge of the membrane of the cell as it's been sliced so that we can see inside both the top and inside the cell at the same time. And this is the wall of the cell. These channels right here are the same as these channels that are represented here, but they've just been cut in half so we can see inside. Each of these channels right now is a sodium ion channel that's supposed to allow the sodium into the cell, but right now they're too small. Each of these channels is too small to let a sodium ion inside. 
However, when the membrane is stretched, you can see that the channels themselves are literally pulled open and they're stretched big enough that the sodium can go inside. And when the sodium goes inside, it sparks a chemical reaction. That's because different different molecules inside the cell and outside the cell are charged to different amounts. They're positive and negative charged. And when that chemical reaction begins, it's, it, it shoots chemicals all the way down the length of the cell that are interpreted as electrical signals because of the different charges of the chemicals. It's interpreted by the brain as electrical signals. So this rushes down the length of the cell all the way up to the brain in a chemical reaction. And that chemical, uh, that, sorry, that electrical signal is then interpreted by the brain as an experience of stretching skin. Now, I want to go back to this picture for a moment to highlight that there, there's one little area of the brain, this little strip right here called the postcentral gyrus, that is responsible for most of the sensations of touch that you experience in your life. And along this strip right here, we have represented in our brain a tiny little person, a little man or a little woman that looks very nothing at all like us it looks in fact like a very distorted version of us like this and the reason why it's so grossly distorted is because different facets of our body are represented by different amounts of cortical region in our brain so our hands and our faces are represented by a lot of cortical neural space and but our torso and our legs, for instance, our back and things like that, are represented by relatively few neurons because we don't actually need to know that much about how we're being touched. It, it's not that important. The, the most important kinds of touch are on our hands and our faces. And so if you look at the way that this little, this little person, this little version of you, is projected onto that somatosensory cortex of the brain, this little strip right here like I described. You can see that it's a little bit disjointed. You've got the body right here with the hand represented in the uh, in this particular gyrus. You've got the face separated from the body. It's not part of the head uh, neural, neural processing, but it's represented along this stretch of these few gyri right here. You've also got some teeth and gums represented and things like that. But the important thing here is that each part of our body is represented differentially by neurons in the brain. Let's now shift gears and talk about the perception of pain. You recall that I said this free nerve cell endings are capable of transducing heat and cold and pain. And the way they do that is they have little receptors on the end of each of these nerve endings that are called nociceptors. And nociceptors are activated by certain chemicals like serotonin and histamine. But the way that they find those chemicals is there are other cells in the surrounding skin over here. I'm going to draw a couple really enlarged with nuclei there so you can tell they're cells. Um, and when damage comes from the external environment, so say there's some threat out here and we experience damage. Ah, don't stab me. Stop, stop. Um, you can see here that a damaged cell is releasing little chemicals here that are like SOS signals. Help, stop. We've got to, we've got to put an end to this right away. So these little uh, chemicals here that have just been released from this dying cell are serotonin or histamine or whatever, depending on the type of cell it is. And they float across over here to the nociceptors. They bind with the nociceptors and different uh, fluids are allowed to go into the cell and the pain signal is sent up to the brain. Now there are different areas of our skin with relatively more free nerve endings that are also more sensitive to pain. These are places that are also overrepresented by other kinds of cells in our body. So hands and face in particular are more sensitive to pain because they have more of these different kinds of nociceptors and free nerve endings. Now you recall from your reading that you have dual pain pathways in the brain, and these pain pathways are mediated by different kinds of fibers. You've got A delta fibers, which is the fast pathway, and you can remember that because it's like A students, there might be faster students. And then you've got C fibers that are mediated in the slower pathway. Well, the A fibers have the goal of sending an immediate signal to the brain that says stop, whatever you're doing, stop, and it sends it to the pons and the midbrain and the thalamus at various levels to say this must end now. But it doesn't have any specificity about the pain, what's going on, why it happened. It's just a stop signal. The C fibers come along later, and they send a signal that's several seconds slower, but it's more integrated. It comes up to the thalamus, and it can say different things, like, what else is going on? 
Contextually, it can send that information to the somatosensory cortex so that we know where the pain is happening. We can send that information to the cingulate cortex where it's integrated with psychological context so that we can overinflate the level of pain or underinflate it based on context and things like that. And it also integrates information from the other sensory receptors that are embedded in the skin in the local area. So we don't know anything about the object from the A delta fibers, but the C fibers are able to integrate information from the Merkel cells and the Ruffini endings and things like that to help us understand the whole experience of what caused the pain. Now, after this information is communicated to the thalamus, there's a, actually a back channel response that happens as well, so that down other neurons is sent a signal that is called substance P. So this right here is the, the brain stem uh, or the spinal cord, depending on where we're slicing, and the signals come down uh, and send out information to uh, the surrounding areas around the damaged cells. So here we've got those damaged cells with some serotonin or histamine or whatever, and uh, around those cells we want to sensitize this so that we're protected against future injury. So you've got some substance P that comes down here, stands for substance pain, and that substance P uh, will, will sensitize the neurons and the cells in this area so that if there is any kind of future damage, if there's any kind of risk of damage at all, that that will hurt faster and easier than it ordinarily would. So it further protects this area from additional injury. It will tell the body, look, we can't even take a little bit of damage right now. We just like, don't even touch it. Don't even come near it. Just don't just steer clear because this area is going to need some time to heal. Anyway, that's uh, some information about how uh, pain is processed in the brain and then also how the brain sends signals back to the body to protect the body from further injury.